Hello, everybody. I'm excited about today's podcast, as I always am. I always say that, but I'm always excited. We've got a great, great show for you today. Hey, but before I introduce today's guest, I want you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit that red subscribe button and then hit the little bell notification. That'll tell you about every Friday we drop a new podcast and you'll be notified so you can be ready to roll on our podcast. Share it with your friends and leave some comments. We want you to leave some comments about uh, what do you think about the podcast? What we can do better? All things like that. If you have any questions for our guest, we'd love for you to leave those in the comments too. I'm going to try to collect all of those questions and get those out and try to answer some of those on the air. Cause I know that uh, one of the things that, that I love to do is to ask Bass Pros questions. And I want to, those questions answered and I want to be like those guys and, uh, and be able to, you know, to fish like them, get my fishing question answered. So without further ado, Coming up, the Bass Chaplin Fishing Podcast, Ot Defoe is next. Hey, welcome back. This is Chris Wells, the Bass Chaplin. I have as my guest today, the man that is ranked number three in the world in professional bass fishing, none other than Ot Defoe. And I say that because I have been <laughs> pronounced yeah, for years, like Mercer said, I, I pronounced his name wrong you know, for a long time too. That's been a big yeah. topic of discussion. But, uh, all right, we're glad you're here, man. Good to see you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Good to see you, Chris. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And, and yeah, you're not the only one guilty of that. A lot of people have done that and, uh, and some still continue to do it. Actually somebody that I room with on occasion, uh, or all the time, he does it on occasion or most of the time. And sometimes for fun and sometimes just, he just does. <laughs> I'm sure we'll, I'm sure we will, uh, we'll be talking about his dialect for, a long oh, yeah. time to come that special roommate that you have on yeah. some of your trips and so man yeah. i see you got a lot of trophies back there i was just talking to you i need to bring all my you know i've got my um georgetown bass masters trophy from 1993 on the cooper river yeah i could put yeah. up there yeah it doesn't look quite as good as some of those blue trophies and some of those mls <laughs> trophies that are good not how many of those trophies you got i well if we was counting right here that'd be one two three four five six uh, seven, eight, nine, beating uh, ten. Uh, there's one offset over here that you can't can't see, but the run out of space after we build it. Um, but about ten, ten, what I would call pretty major trophies from open. ten wins, ten, ten, ten major trophies. Man, that's impressive. I'm telling you, you are uh, you definitely got it going on. Uh, now, I you are from Strawberry Plains, Tennessee. That's where you live now. Is that where you've always lived? Well, so I live in Blaine is, is, is Blaine. our little town. Okay. Yeah, Blaine. Uh, the little town where I went to elementary K through eight was in downtown Strawberry Plains. Downtown. Um, so the, the exit off the interstate where I lived forever was Strawberry Plains Pike. And a lot of people call that area Straw Plains, but it's actually not. The actual Strawberry Plains is in Jefferson County, which is where I went to uh, went K through eight at Rush Strong, but I technically grew up Knoxville. Knox County was my address. Um, but, uh, but yeah, straw plains is right there where I went to school and then went to Jefferson County. Um, high and then, uh, but yeah, we've lived over here in Blaine for a little over four years now in Granger County. Yeah. I've been out there. I, I've actually been in Ott's garage. We talk about mm -hmm. Ott's garage a lot. All of us are talking about Ott's garage these days. So <laughs> how's Ott's garage doing? I mean, how's all that, uh, how's the garage yeah, looking it, it's good? it's it's kind of a mess at the moment i was gone you know with our first three stages on bass pro tour were all pretty quick and so stuff didn't have a lot of time in between to get organized and cleaned out uh, so I, I have been home a few days and everything is everywhere so it's kind of a the garage is a little bit of a mess it's a need of some uh need of some organizing of some time spent down there but that's where i'm at and this little studio space is actually upstairs in the garage so okay um yeah this is that's where this uh this studio space now you is. built another building since i was in your garage is this the, is that the same garage now your garage looks like the bass pro shop i'd i'd rather go to your garage <laughs> than, than a lot of tackle yeah. stores and so uh, yeah that's that, that's this building here yeah that's this detached garage that we built um it's a uh, 42 by 60 i believe is what it is um but yeah really really awesome space we're really, very thankful for it that's awesome that's a cool deal. The, um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to, to ask you about, uh, you know, how did you start tinkering with crankbaits and stuff? All you 
Tennessee guys. That seems to be like a a Tennessee staple with all you you guys. You seem to have these cool flat sided running crankbaits. Where did all that start? Yeah, it really started early for me in my fishing career. The guy that I grew up fishing with, um, Jason Nichols is his name. His dad built baits, so I mean that was that was something that he he did. You know, I mean, and and so we fished a lot of his baits in in early tournaments. Jason's about fifteen years older than I am and uh but yeah his dad had built weights forever so you know and, and there were a lot of other bait builders here in this area but I, I learned it largely from Steve Nichols um mm-hmm. is, is who I who I kind of got my got my start in it from and I fished a few tournaments with Steve um but yeah Steve was who I who I learned how to build a crankbait from and you know what you need to do to make it run and all that kind of stuff did Steve have like a commercial <laughs> operation or was it just kind of a local oh, no. secret <laughs> No, no, it was yeah, far from commercial. Um, his his crankbait building space was the half the size of this this little studio area here. Um, you know, in the corner of a garage, everything from cutting them out to the final clear coat of epoxy all happened in a, in a space smaller than this. Uh, you know, I mean, it was a yeah, far from being a commercial operation. But he did sell those. I mean, that, those were baits that he he did sell um he had a couple local stores that he sold them through and then the you know the fishing shows then people would just call him up and you know say hey i'd I'd like to get six of these four of those whatever um but but mostly it was he had had a little network like i said there were you know three or four local tackle shops and then uh then the big fishing shows uh that's where he did did most of his selling Man, that's fascinating. You know, one of the best when eBay first came out, one of the best eBay purchase ever sales I ever did. I uh, had a friend of mine, he left me a bunch of tackle and uh, he had something called the original Tennessee shad. I don't know if you remember yeah. that bait or not. I it had a picture that, yeah. of the state of Tennessee on it. And that thing went yeah. for so much money. I was like, I was looking at Western auto stores all over Tennessee <laughs> trying to find that sucker. That was pretty yeah. cool. So, you know, what really made me depressed today is I was looking over your stats and stuff. And then I, it dawned on me that you were born my freshman year in high, in college. Not even high school, my freshman year of college. I mean, I was like, golly, yeah. I'm on death's doorstep. I'm a, <laughs> it's been yeah. feeling pretty bad. Well, we've known each other for a long time. And the other day, well, yeah. um, I talked to you. Uh, you know, you guys are so gracious to me. You let me stay at a lot of, you know, with you a lot of times, uh, you know, when I'm out on the road and uh, and, and you guys talk. And the other day, we were talking about, uh, you know, we're on, I was on the way to Aaron Martin's uh, memorial. Mm-hmm. And you called mm-hmm. me up and we talked for about an hour about turkey yeah. hunting. Cause I couldn't believe that, uh, <laughs> you would actually, you have actually legitimately and genuinely gotten into turkey hunting. Is that right? It's, it's very, very true. And Jenny would say, unfortunately, very true. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so I'm, I'm pretty excited about, uh, you know, about the time coming up here. I, I, I've actually, after our our heavy hitters event, which is in early April, I'm sadly going to miss opening. I'll, I'll miss youth weekend and, I, and i'm also gonna miss opening weekend but um but there's once i get home from that i i think i'll get home on like good friday and of course we'll have easter uh easter monday from yeah. then until about the next 10 days till i have to leave again don't bother calling <laughs> the, uh, there's no, no need in it um the only calling that will be done will be in the woods calling out a turkey um uh, so, uh, yeah, those, those, eight or I 10 can't days, believe that, you know, that blows yeah. my mind. Cause a number of years ago, it was, uh, me you and Andy were, were, uh, and, and Lester <laughs> and a bunch of guys were, were up in New York. I think it was on St. Lawrence or somewhere like that. That's we were right. staying together. And I still have a video of, of Andy Montgomery trying to hit a, a wasp nest with his jig, but that's another story. Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah. the, um, I was sworn to secrecy about that video, but anyway, <laughs> yeah. and so, you know, Andy didn't make the cut and he's like, uh, mm. Well, Chris, what are we going to do? And I'm like, we can go fishing. He goes, that ain't going to happen. Cause Andy, Andy, yeah. just doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't fish for fun apparently. But, uh, anyway, yeah. so we went out looking for deer and one afternoon you went out with us and you were like, man, I don't care anything about hunting. How did you make the switch that, I mean, what, what was the big thing with you converting to being a hunter all of a sudden what's yeah, going on? And, and, and it's, I mean, Turkey's my favorite, but I, I enjoy duck hunting and I enjoy deer hunting. Um, I, I, it was, it really, it started with the kids, um, showing interest in it and, uh, and t- took them and truly watching how excited they got with deer. That was the first time that they, they went hunting for. And, uh, 
and and it got me too i mean just sitting there you know and the anticipation of hearing hearing you know some limbs crack and hearing some leaves rustle and it's like you know you, you don't know what's coming around the bush and then but with turkey hunting the fact of of hearing them talk calling to them you know hearing them gobble hearing them hearing the hens yelp and stuff and that's and then trying to call them back to them and trying to you know have a conversation with them and, and get them get them close enough to in the shoes and then the, then there is just so much that can go wrong and and it's kind of like tournament fishing at that point and that the times when it messes up and you don't kill one then the next time when it actually works out and you do it makes that time so much sweeter because of the ones that did get you know that didn't truly go right um uh, the the one turkey i got to kill um this past year that i'll sit down i put my decoys out they gobbled on the roost i called five long beards come in and i shot one of them i mean oh, it, it was it was as easy as it gets the one turkey that uh that parker killed last year i mean we we messed up three or four that day we, we'd hunted some and had you know had bumped some and had some chances and, and stuff it just never happened but that particular day he had i'd let him skip school and that morning i mean we had one on the roost we we were sitting in the right place but it got scared it got spooked by the decoy and uh and you know so he should have had we not had the decoy out he had to shot one in the first 10 minutes wow. but we kept after it all day and and at like 9 30 he ended up he ended up killing one after we'd had a couple more encounters you know so it made that turkey that much sweeter that it truly he didn't kill the one that would have been the easy one you know so um it's the, yeah that that chasing them has, has become as you know that's it's so much fun turkey hunters are fanatical you know i told you about my college roommate <laughs> he's a guy and i can legitimately say this he's the best turkey caller in the world he, he really is yep. uh you know one uh, every every major <laughs> turkey calling you know championship in the world and i was telling um yeah you know, i've been trying to bro I, i've noticed in my life i'm the connector guy i connect people <laughs> up and they never hear from me again and they just kind of but i was talking to andy about you know i said hey uh you know mark said that he would mark prudham is my buddy he said uh i said mark said he would come down there and you know and call those turkeys in for you guys let y'all shoot them and then y'all could work out some kind of tackle deal or something like that yeah, and he said, yeah. uh, and Andy said, well, you know, we, we, me and I like to call them in too. And I said, listen, <laughs> I love to skip a jig under a dock. Okay. I do. But yeah. when Andy Montgomery's in the boat, I'm going to let him skip the jig under the dock. You know, and he, was <laughs> like, he was like, that's a dang good point right there. You just made. <laughs> that was a pretty yeah. cool deal. Pretty yeah. well. Well, yeah, hey, let, tell, let's get back to fishing them. here. So well, tell, um, well, before, before yeah, we go ahead. tell them the one thing that you told me the other day about, uh, I thought this was really funny. I think your, your listeners on your podcast will too what you'd said about Mark and how he's won, he's won, you know, all these, all these accolades of right, all different yeah. kinds of calls. But, but the question that somebody asked him about an elk. Yeah. An elk, yeah. He won no, that. T- tell him that. His, uh, you know, he's, he's the only man in America to win a national championship in every game calling category. And so, uh, last year he won the world elk calling championship. And, uh, after he won the championship, the lady was interviewing him and she said, now, what do you do? when an elk is hung up and you can't get him to come in, he said, ma'am, I've never been out of Georgetown County, South Carolina. I've never seen an elk in my life. <laughs> so yeah, that's, a, that's a truth that yeah. he, he never goes yeah. anywhere, but the, you know, that's just awesome. like, um, we talk about this a lot. We talk about how fishing it, being a professional fisherman is a gift. You yeah. know, a lot of people don't believe that. Well, the, the hunting, the calling and all that, all that's a gift from God. And, Absolutely. uh, you know, I've heard people say, um, well, you know, Chris, you could be just as good as those pro fishermen if you spend all that time on the water. And I'm like, you know, if that was true, then Rick Clun and Guy Aker would win every single tournament because they've had yeah. more time on the yeah. water than anybody else. Uh, but right. but it's not like that. It, it's a gift from God, and uh, and and just like uh, I can practice my golf swing all I want to, and I'll never hit it like Phil Mickelson. You know, I can, yeah. I can practice my spinnerbait all the way. I can get better, but I'll, <laughs> I'll never throw it like Kevin Van Dam. And so it's a, it's yeah. a different guide. So that's definitely, yeah, a, a cool that, that, there's not, yeah, there's, there's no question. I, I think God gives us, I, I know God gives us each individual talents. And, and I mean, one looking at you, one that I know is a talent of yours is, is your ability to speak. Um, that's something that, you know, I've been able to listen to you several times at different events and, and your ability, your ability to deliver a message that people can understand and, and can get, you know, can help 
you know, can, can help somebody. That's, that's something that's definitely a talent that you have. And God gives us all, he gives us all talents and he gives us all, um, he, he gives us desires and he gives us, you know, a work, a work ethic. Mm-hmm. And that's something that, that I'm very thankful of. Um, you know, as, as he gives us, an, I think there's a lot of people and, and I, and I certainly feel this way about my, about my fishing. He gave me enough talent and I have enough God given talent, but I also have enough God given desire and passion for it mm. that what I lack in, in simple God given talent that he gives me the, the, the desire to work on, on my own, you know, to also help make that better as well. Right, man. That's what a great point that is. Okay. So tell me about your fishing journey. How did, how did mm-hmm. not defo become a professional bass fisherman? What, what was your, what was your fishing journey? Tell, tell us about that. So I, I fished my, I'll, I'll keep this within the uh, time limits of this <laughs> podcast. Um, but I, I fished my first tournament with my dad when I was nine years old, it was his first tournament. He, had, he was, he was not a tournament fisherman or anything. Um, but, uh, but I think that that was important that, you know, that people know that. Cause a lot of people are like, well, you know, Randy house. of course, I mean, he fished his first tournament with his dad. Well, yeah, his dad had fished 10,000 tournaments, you know, <laughs> so that, that just know that that wasn't the case with me. That was my dad's first tournament, uh, as well. But, uh, but yeah, so started fishing local tournaments, fishing team tournaments, fish with my dad, some fish with some other folks, some. Um, um, cause I've got a brother that's a couple years older. So, well, there's, there's three of us you only allowed two in the tournament. So Sonny would fish, my brother would fish with another guy, some, and then I'd fish with dad. Then we'd alternate. I'd fish with this other guy. And this, my brother would fish with my dad at that point in time, you know? So, um, so we did that I fished local tournaments, joined the bass club. I think when I was 12, 13, somewhere in there and, uh, and fish with my dad, mostly in those tournaments. Once I got old enough to go into the draw. Um, I would, I was in the draw and those were, you know, back in the day of boater, boater draw type stuff. So this guy had the troll motor half the day, you would have the troll motor half the day. Um, and all the while fishing, lots of local tournaments in between that, uh, started fishing BFLs when I was 16 and, uh, and fished BFLs a couple of years and then started in the ever start series is what it was back then oh, yeah. when I was, uh, 18, as I started in those, um, fished that a couple of years, 2006, fished the FLW series, which was kind of the precursor. That was the first year of that division. So they had the Toyotas kind of triple A level. Then they had the FLW tour, right. that FLW series kind of fit in between. It was the entry fee level of the tour and the payout and stuff, but, um, just a couple less events. And it actually it pulled a lot of big names. I remember of that first year. Gerald Swindle and Aaron Martins and Greg Hackney and, and a lot of big names from Bass jumped over and fished those because it was, yeah. you know, a few extra tournaments with big payouts and, and stuff um, and had, a you know, had a pretty good schedule. So fished that 2006, 2007, uh, started fishing the force of the FLW tour, uh, fished there from 2007 through 2010. And then 2010, I, I also fished the Bassmaster Opens qualified for the elite series which i switched to in 2008 right and yeah. and fished there for eight years until the uh, we started the bass pro tour with major league fishing and have been there ever since right now you know you won the you won the uh the last really the last bass masters classic that that uh, most of the major league fishing guys fished how special was that you did it you did it right there at home i mean yeah you know, that, practically that, that, so. yeah oh yeah no i did i slept in my own bed every night um yeah it definitely was at home that that was it, it was incredible you know and that it's it, it's odd to think about but that was my last bass master event you know i mean right. to, to date i've not fished an open or anything since um so yeah that was my last last event i don't know if, if many other people other than maybe hank parker <laughs> that their yeah. last event i think i think hank's last one was a classic win i, I believe i'm not 100 percent sure yes that's, um, that's true yeah 1989 but, uh, yeah okay yeah so um yeah i guess we i guess we share that in common yeah. but um but but yeah no it's it and it was incredibly special i mean you know to to get to fish against that group of guys that was my eighth classic i fished eight years on the lead series made the classic every year um that was my eighth classic and and fishing against the guys, um, you know, so many guys that I look up to and, and have looked up to and, and respect on and off the water. And, um, you know, yeah, that to, to win that here at home made it just that much more special because those were, you know, so many family friends and, and everybody that were there in the audience and, 
Um, people out on the water, my dad and my brother were actually out on the water on the final right. day as well to, to get to be out there and, and watch me catch a couple there towards the end of the day. Yeah. So it's, I, I don't, I'll never, in, in my professional career, I'll never top that. I mean, that, right. Yeah. I just won't. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I win, you know, in the future. I, I don't see any way anything professionally tops that for me personally. I, I right. just don't know how it could. Man, it was an awesome day. I remember, uh, you know, one particular fish you caught and you could just tell, I said, man, he's going to win it. He's going to win this. Thing. And it, was, uh, I mean, it was pretty exciting. It was a pretty yeah. cool deal. I know it was for you yeah. as well. It yeah. was for all of us as well. Well, Hey, um, so this is a segment that I like to do at most of them. Uh, one of the things I wanted to do, uh, was a long time ago. I wanted to do kind of a kind of an old Larry Nixon, Hey, watch this and I'll help you get better type of deal. Cause I'm always trying yeah. to get better, even though I'm 55 and I'm a nothing, nobody. And, uh, but, but if the average angler, what would you tell if you could give them three tips to just say, you know what, this is going to get you better as an angler. Yeah. This is going to help your fishing. What would be some of those tips, three or four things that you'd tell us? Well, one thing that I think a lot of people don't realize, um, how important it is and this goes for almost any presentation um is how important and especially moving baits i, I love to fish a crankbait this especially applies to uh to crankbait fishing um but a lot of presentations i mean this even can can have to do with the fall rate on a jig or something like that but how important speed is to generating bites um and especially like i said crankbait fishing Fishing a bait, if that water is is fairly warm, and fairly warm being honestly 55, 57 degrees and up. So most of the fishing we do outside of the wintertime, speed is really, really important to generating more bites. I mean, if you're just fishing the bait at a, at a moderate retrieve, you're going to catch some fish. And there are most definitely times when that is better. But so much of the time, a medium fast to fast retrieve with a crankbait Will generate more bites and i just i see so many people that are fishing their bait just kind of what i would call a moderate you know speed retrieve um i mean i use a six eight to one gear ratio reel right. for my crankbaits but i mean there's times i'm really really re reeling that thing our, our last event down at uh, down at stage three in, in alabama on lewis smith edwin and i were fishing same general part of the lake not really the same water but same general part of the lake right. and similar patterns and and we both said the same thing you couldn't we were mostly catching spotted bass in that situation but the water was 55 to 57 not hot by any means yeah. you could not fish a bait too fast it was really? it was ridiculous you could not really too fast uh, i can already tell so, how many mistakes i've made i'm like golly i'm really not going way <laughs> too slow that's crazy yeah yeah so speed the speed would be one with your retrieve um you know, one that is is ever changing is is electronics. Um, you know, I mean, it's I've I've used a form of forward facing sonar with 360 um, for uh, six or eight years at this point, and and I've caught an unbelievable amount of bass with it. Um, it's great for fishing targets, which is honestly how I like to fish. Um, but using that forward facing sonar to either to actually target specific fish or to target a piece of cover. But it, it does come with a managing, managing that information. Right. I mean, you, there's, you, you gotta, you gotta know just because there's fish there, you're not necessarily, they're not necessarily in the mood to bite right now, or, you know, you may have already messed them up or whatever, but the, the time management with, with, uh, you know, with that sonar and just how much information we're now getting back from what's going on under the water, managing that, you know, saying, Hey, this is, this is a time when I can capitalize with this. These fish are set up. I can use this. I can catch them. It can work for me. And there's times when it's like, I said, turn this stuff off and go back to fishing mm -hmm. and kind of, kind of picking, you know, picking out. And I don't have a definitive answer on that one, but <laughs> just saying, you know, look, look at that and try to learn that as an angler, what, what works for you, um, you know, with that, with that sonar. And then kind of the last one. And I, and I think that, uh, I think that a lot of anglers, if they follow the tournament circuits and, and this, again, this past event was a prime, prime example of it. Dustin Cannell won on the final day 
nobody was going to beat him. I, I don't feel like, um, you know, with the school of fish that he got on in Clearwater, actually fishing a place that was current related, but with what I would call Clearwater finesse techniques. Okay, was how, how he caught his fish. Of the top 10, of maybe two or three of them were fishing that way. A couple of them were kind of fishing a mix between shallow, dirty water, power fishing stuff, and mixing in some finesse. And there were, there were a handful of us that were strictly dirty water, strictly power fishing techniques, you know, bladed jigs, shallow running crankbaits. You know, so you can, you can, on most any situation, you can find a place to be successful and successful, in my opinion, making the top 10. You can find a place to be successful on most bodies of water doing whatever you like to do, mm. however you like to fish. Most of the time, you know, especially with our format, I think with major league fishing, you can find a place that works for you. It's not like you have to say, okay, I'm going to Lewis Smith Lake. I need to take only spinning rods and I've got to fish out in 30 to 100 feet of water. You didn't have to do that. You could also be up in the dirt, you know, throwing a chatterbait in three feet of water if that's how you wanted to fish. Right. Wow. So just just finding finding those areas as an angler saying, this is my strong suit. This is how I want to catch them. And most of the time you're able to find a way to do that. Man, that is good stuff. That is awesome stuff right there. Well, hey, JOJ is going well. And uh, Thank you. I try to tune in whenever I can, and it is always great. But uh, so let's talk a little bit about your faith. You are outspoken yes. in your faith. How did you come to faith? What, what is the, what, what, what was the process of you coming to know the Lord? Yeah. Yeah. For me, um, I had growing up, we went to church some off and on kind of here and there. And, but then when we really started going to church, <laughs> you'll get a kick out of this. So my dad was raised Southern Baptist. My mom was raised Catholic. All right. They met in the, they met in the middle and went. we went to Methodist. <laughs> it was kind of there. <laughs> wow. It was kind of there, there um, you know, where, where we're going to meet in the middle. And this was, again, I mean, I was yeah. a kid, so this has been 20 plus years ago. So, right. uh, yeah, Methodist was different than it is now. Um, but that was that was where we started going, going to church, was at a Methodist church. And we had went there, I'm going to say, for a couple of years, um, you know, pretty regularly. And, and I, I knew there was something I was supposed to do. I was, I'm going to say we started going when I was oh, eight or nine years old, somewhere in that range. Um, you know, and I, and I, I, I don't know. I don't really remember there being an invitation time given right, on yeah. most Sundays, maybe on occasion, right. but it, you know, it was, it, it wasn't really presented that way. And, uh, and dad had said, I, you know, I, I really want to, uh, I really want y'all to, to, you know, go to a Baptist church um, and, and kind of just see a different side of, of Christianity. And so right. we went, we started going to a, a Baptist church here, some Thorn Grove Baptist is the, is the name of it that we went to at that point in time. And we hadn't been going there just a couple, three or four Sundays and, and actually a couple of deacons from that church come and, and made a house visit there to us. Uh, I, I don't know if dad, I truly don't know if dad had that set up or if the, if those men just, you know, that was part yeah. of their normal deal as deacons was to, you know, to go, you know, visit visitors that had come through and, and maybe had filled out a card or something. Right. Yeah. Um, but either way, those those men had came by and they actually, you know, they they talked with my brother and I, who's a couple of years older than I am, of, you know, if had we ever been saved and what that process was and, you know, really laid out the plan of salvation for us. Right. And, and neither of us had ever accepted Christ at that point in time. And we actually prayed there on the on the concrete out in front of, mm. of the boat garage there um at, at mom and dad's house and and we both in, at that time at, at that day you know prayed to receive the lord so um and then followed through with baptism i feel like it was a couple months later um there in the in the church um uh, and and thorn grove baptist so yeah that was that was my coming to you know that was my salvation experience was right. was uh you know those, those men who had we're serving as deacons in that church that, that came and, and really shared the gospel with, you know, with my brother and I, um, and that I was 13 or so at that point in time. And, yeah. and so I, you know, I, I felt like I understood it pretty good and, um, you know, and, and certainly my, my walk with the Lord started then. And sometimes we walked close and sometimes we, we had right. some space between us, you know, yeah. but after, after Jenny and I got, you know, we were dating and then after we got married, um, you know, for the first few years of marriage, it, it really wasn't a, a 
focus of ours. We'd go to church with her parents. Some we'd go to church with my parents. Some honestly, whoever had the better dinner or lunch offer, <laughs> yeah. um, is who we would, <laughs> we'd go to church with. Um, but uh, but you know, we we went with them some. But then really, around the time when uh, when Abby was born, um, you know, and, and even before that, we had. I think it was around the time when we were trying um, and had been for a little bit, we had went to a, a focus meeting at an FLW event where Chris Jones spoke. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, you know, we went to that and, and he talked about there about him and his wife praying together. And, and that was something that we'd been married for a couple of years at that point in time and something we had never been comfortable doing. Um, and, you know, that really, like, I feel like that kind of really, you know, brought, Christ in our marriage where he should have been from the start. Um, and w- not that we didn't have any marital problems at that point in time, right. but that really, really helped bring us closer to, to each other as well as to God, um, you know, was, was going to that focus meeting and kind of hearing what Chris had to, had to share there. And, uh, and yeah. And then not long after that, um, you know, was when, when Abby was born, not, not too terribly long after that. And that really, you know, it seems like it takes some, sometimes for some people and i guess we were one of those that it takes those life moments to realize hey there's yeah. there are bigger things to focus on you know than just chasing your career and you know trying to earn the next paycheck and uh, paying the mortgage then uh you know so right. that was ha- having having a child in our life at that point in time was like hey we, we need to be a good example for this human being that we're responsible for yeah. now and, uh, and try to make sure that they end up going on the way that they should go Right now, now, how hard is it to, you know, you're in the industry where obviously there is a, uh, there's kind of a, a, a milieu of faith around your family. Fishing is kind of always promoted as family, but it's not always faith. It's not always, uh, no. you know, an industry that, uh, you know, that lives out their faith. They may talk mm-hmm. out their faith a lot, but how difficult is it to live out your faith on, on tour? Yeah, for for me, Chris, I I I don't feel it too difficult at this point in time. You know, I I'm very I'm very thankful um, for for what God has done in my life. You know, and it, and it's very easy for me to um, you know to give that praise back to Him at this point in time. I but I, I know kind of like what we we're talking about in the beginning, those, you know, those God given talents. I know the success that I have had. Any of these trophies back here behind me. I can tell you every one of them how, of how God made each one of those work, you know, and, yeah. and that's, that's why I don't, you know, I, I'm thankful for every one of those because I feel like it's given me another opportunity to share what, what he did, you know, yeah. and, and each of those events, which are, which are unbelievable things, but at, I mean, at the end of the day and eternity, none of those will matter, you know, um, right. but, but while we're here, it, it, it gave me a place to say, Hey, God did this for this to allow this to happen. God can do much bigger things than this in your life. You know, I mean, that's, and that's what I try to, I try to keep that focus to help people realize that, that as great as, as any of those accolades are, that's not the prize that we're really striving for. Um, But I, I, with the classic in particular, Mm -hmm. the, the, the prayer that I had prayed before that event started was that he would be glorified. And, and I, I wanted him to use me. But I, I, um, I just wanted him to be glorified more than anything. And on the first day, it was an easy prayer to pray. On the second day, it was a much tougher prayer to pray because that day didn't, didn't go so well. On the morning of the third day, I, I prayed that again, and I completely left it to him. And, and, I, right. and I knew at that point in time, I had... I had you know, I had left that at his feet. It right. was, was the way I felt once that day came together and, and it ended up the way that it did. I then felt the burden of responsibility to make sure that I upheld my end of the bargain. Mm. You know, I, I really, I really felt that way. And I still feel that way. Um, because I, I know the gift that that was personally for, for my career and for my family. Um, and that's, that's at a lot of times that's where I look to, to say, Hey, this is, I, I know this is for your glory. Keep me grounded. Keep me, keep me the same person and just make sure that, that God's glorified in it. Right. One of the ways you guys do that is, is J O J and that's mm-hmm. a Jesus 
Ott and Jenny. Where where can we yeah. where can we listen to to JOJ each week? Tell the listeners where they can yeah. tune in. Almost every Sunday, and I say almost <laughs> because typically the first Sunday of the month we do a live version. Um, so if I'm home, it's easy because we sit right here and we we do that live version um, here at, at the house. This past Sunday, the Sunday of the first Sunday in April, I'll be gone. So who knows when that one is? But all the rest of the Sundays outside of the first one, you can always you can always catch that on our YouTube channel. I think it's six thirty um, Eastern time that it goes live. It's either six thirty or seven thirty. You you may know better than I do. Um, yeah. But, uh, okay. But um, but but yeah, on on YouTube, um, that 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 goes live every every Sunday evening. Uh, We're going to try to put a link channel, up so at, at, okay. the, uh, at the bottom of my my deal on this episode. That'll okay. be good good deal yeah so we're yeah, gotten that, that to the was... time joj is going well mm -hmm. and now we're getting to the time it's become a very uh a very anticipated segment of the last <laughs> chaplain fishing podcast and that's uh okay where i defoe does an impression of another angler and i've what got a, i've got kind of okay. a uh i got you you're gonna do, you're gonna do an impression of of whatever angler you want to do okay so uh so whoever you want to do mm. Uh, and I got a, I got a, a, kind of a suspicion who you might go for, but, but go ahead and tell us, <laughs> tell us who you're yeah. going to do an impression of, man, I, I'm kicking it. I'm kicking it around in my head because I'll fall short on any of these. I know I will. Um, and the, the obvious choice would be Andy Montgomery. <laughs> um, I mean, that, that would be the obvious one. Andy and I've roomed together for, uh, for a long time at this point in time. And, and we know each other pretty well, but Andy has such a thick accent that it really be pretty hard for my tennessee lingo to well, um you sound like to, you're way up north yeah you're right, right. <laughs> yeah it, it would really be way off i would like to do it of cliff crochet but it wouldn't it wouldn't bode well for the bass chaplain podcast most likely every everybody you know uh james niggemeyer <laughs> did crochet right off the bat boom I mean, okay. right off the bat. Okay. Everybody, crochet <laughs> seems to be the one that everybody wants to go to so uh, right. whoever right. you want to do uh -huh. you you go Let, let's hear it now you know, this, this i'm going to go with edwin because he, he's not oh. um he, he really doesn't have that much of an accent I, I know i have more than he does um so so trying to get mine leveled off to a midwesterner or you know oklahoma guy but the thing that i can do with edwin is mo more of his facial and body language okay impressions. Let's see so so as long as the people and, it, and it's you know it's like that's a big one. He's looking at. He's looking at. Like, you see him right there. He's on my active target. He's on. He's on there. See. Uh, uh, I'm not, uh, hey, here he comes. Here he comes. Here he comes. Uh, 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 and then he's great. And he's really, he's really nervous. And it's really, you know, he's really into it. Then he, then he hooks the fish. Oh, it's a big one. Oh, it's a big one. It's a big one. Yeah. I like that, that man. I like it. I, I like it. I could, I could yeah. close my eyes and picture EE. E. You know, yeah. reeling that sucker in, doing uh, that, so. yeah, yeah, a lot, yeah. A, lot of, a lot of squeaking kind of noises. I love it, man. Yeah. I love it. I think I, you know, I, I'm, I like doing. Andy's pretty cool because you know you you flip over and every morning, and you know this better than anybody. Uh, Andy, it, it's it's wild when you, when you're rooming with you guys. It's like you're up and you're out the door. It's like I, it's up bathroom out the door. See you later. Gone. Boom, gone. Yeah. Yep. Andy's like this. He kind of rolls his feet over and he kind of starts rubbing his head and he goes, Oh man. Yeah. Living the dream. Living, Living the dream. Living the dream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so he, he's slow. He's the slowest one uh on the water and the first one off the water, I think, on practice day. So that's uh yep. that's kind of his moniker. But man, this has been is. an awesome time. Uh, we, I feel like we could have talked all day on this yeah. one, but I know uh, I know you got to run and and man, I appreciate you taking the time to do it and listen you I, i'm looking at my youtube subscribers i'm looking at your you got about twenty eight thousand plus youtube subscribers i think you ought to throw us a shout because we you yeah know, we started the classic with like 409 and we handed out right. two thousand cards and now we're at like 430 <laughs> we're not growing exponentially but uh yeah we do need yeah. a shout out from from I, I, on, on, the, on the youtube uh channel there to to follow us but yeah. but if you are if you are watching us on youtube today we ask that you click the red subscribe button and then click that little bell and it'll tell you on fridays when this podcast drops i right, thanks for being my guest today it was awesome man i look forward to talking to you again
Absolutely, Chris. Thank you for having me on. And yeah, we will definitely next time we record some JOJ, we will we'll throw you a shout out on there. Awesome time. This is the Bass Chaplain yeah. Fishing Podcast.